And uh, you're just going to have to look at the green faces in my presentation because somehow, no matter which Macintosh computer we plug the projector into, it doesn't want to show any reds at all. So we'll suffer through it. And you know that I'm not that
I care a lot about distributions. Was anybody in Belgium when I talked about App Source? Anybody? A couple of people. I've been thinking for years about the role that uh, a distribution or a feature or an application has in our ecosystem and how we can benefit from that. To that effect, uh, well, that so <laughs> my day job is to work with the e-commerce guys uh, as the director of products, and we actually own and produce a Drupal distribution. Oh, poor Celine. <laughs> She's really green. <laughs> we produce the Drupal Commerce, Commerce Takes Our Distribution, which is an out of the box uh, store ready to ship physical goods and do e commerce online. So I think I'll just stay in this day in and day out. And I wanted to talk to you all about some of my thoughts and observations about where we are with Drupal distributions. So in, in, in the description of the session, I asked, are we doing distributions right? And will the other of us reach the promised land, whatever, whatever that is? But before we get to you know, the answers to the rhetorical questions, let's actually back up a little bit and investigate what is a Drupal distribution. Because as we said, the number of verticals is nearly unlimited and the opportunities are numerous. So Drupal's our first class citizens on Drupal or distributions are first class citizens on Drupal Tower. So they live at the same level as modules and core and themes. Um, they're therefore very important in our information architecture and on the website. And the steps to make a distribution are roughly um, for you developers, you're going to do a code start today in case you want to go make one. Um, you make something called the Drush Make File, which is a list of modules and libraries and patches that you want in your distribution. And when you put that into the network, magic happens. It takes that list of all the things that you specify and it grabs them from all of the internet. It can be on GitHub, it can be on Drupal.org. There's a a white list of sources where you can get other libraries that you want in your distribution. So the first step is a collection step of all of the software and the modules and the themes and everything, the modifications even, of Drupal that you want to be in your distribution. And then it packages that all together and makes it one downloadable product. And when you install that downloadable product, then more magic happens because it gives you a chance as a developer to uh, inject your configuration and do all of the steps of site building that you would normally do with Drupal when you're getting started to get the person installing it to a certain point. So here's an example of the install process. This is from a distribution called Commons, which Commons 3.0, which is something produced, maintained by Aqua. This was released uh, last week, I believe. And one of the things in the installation process, one of the ways that you can configure the distribution in this one is to um, choose the color palette. And they have the choice between green and purple. And more than purple. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to talk to those web designers about it. This is the color line. And the result is really nice looking. Um, <laughs> much more on the website out of the box than if you just go and drive Drupal. How many of you remember the day when you first just installed Drupal Core for the first time, looked at it blindly, blankly, questioningly, <laughs> Drupal, what art thou? <laughs> right? it's, it's like, it doesn't really give you a lot to go on when you first install it. So the idea of distribution is that it, it takes those first steps for you. How many steps? takes is a question. And you know, a lot of people actually make distributions. I mean, a lot of companies are investing a lot of time and money making a lot of distributions. So I just showed you comments from Acquia, but phase two has four of them. I only have three of them out there, but they really focus on open public, open publish, and to a, to a lesser extent, open Atrium. Commerce guys, I mentioned we make one called Commerce Kickstarter. That's been a team of four or five developers for most of the year. It's a big, big, big effort. It's not a trivial expense. 
to make something like Congress and stuff. There's a German company called Bright Solutions. Who's ever heard of Erpal? It's a full ERP system built in Drupal. And they're building and maintaining that. They're just releasing the first, the first versions. Um, the company formerly known as known as Node One, Google Cloud, uh, has a distribution called NodeStream. Anybody use it? Yeah. Who knows the company Funny Monkey? <laughs> They're a Portland company. They focus on education. They have a triple distribution called um, Julio or Julio. I'm not quite sure how they say it. Julio. Julio? Yeah, from me and Julio down in the schoolyard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Big shout, another company in the US. They're building a CRM called Red Hen. Who's, who's trying that? Open a church. <laughs> there you go. All the of course, you got open church. It's actually one of the most popular distributions that are it's been around a long time too. Level ten makes one called Open Enterprise. Pantheon makes one called Denali. That's the collection of black boxes. Uh, you see none of it. Just panels and configurable blocks. Chapter three uh, has one that they're actually, I believe, moving away from a bit called Open Academy. Probably because there are at least five other education and uh, university focused distributions that I know of, including Elms and uh, Open Scholar, is another one. So, this is a very expensive business. None of those were trivial efforts. They all have full marketing sites, they all have years of developer into it. It's especially expensive business when you consider that out of 887,000 Drupal sites that Drupal.org reports, 6,400 of them uh, are Commerce Kickstarter sites. That's the most popular distribution. And the next 10 distros combined only account for 4,000 results altogether. So that's not very many. That's total of the 11 most popular Drupal distributions reported to Drupal.org. That accounts for only 1.2% of the Drupal install base. That's a lot of money to invest for such a very small install base. So another, another really important aspect of distribution I started telling you a bit about how you make them, that list, that make file, and you put it on Drupal.org, and it just apps around the internet, grabbing things, and it smushes them together. There's another interesting concept. Who, who here uses the feature module and the features way of developing in your workflow? All right, now we're on home turf. Great. A lot of you know about features. What is the feature module? So if you look at the pages on Drupal.org for uh, a lot of those distributions that I just went through, for example, um, this is for Drupal Commons. So look at, look at the names here. Commons Events, Commons Notices, Commons Radio Activity. Who uses the Radio Activity module? It's awesome. It's really good. Um, what that is, the Commons Radio Activity is actually a feature module that they've exported from all of the configuration of the dependencies that Commons uh, needs in order to use this other module called the Radio Activity Module, which is just this uh, really cool tool for measuring the current popularity of content on your site. So it's in a position to show you which posts people are looking at the most right now on your website. Radio Activity, check it out, it's very good. And the pattern that I'm showing you here, and if I show you another one here, is um, one called uh, from a distribution called Open Outreach, which is very good, um, and all of their uh, feature modules are called debut something, so debut article, debut bio, debut blog, etc. All of these are glue modules between the distribution and some other modules that they want to use in the distribution. And the glue modules are very important. So here's a, another list from Open Enterprise. So, blog, links, forum, images, really basic stuff in all cases, stuff that we take for granted on most of the websites that we use on a day to day basis. They have these connectors that are feature exports, and the way it works is the developer will build the site, will build the distribution, configure it, and code it the way they want to, and they'll use the features module, and this is the interface to the features module, to check all of the uh, bits and pieces of the work that they've done 
that they can then export into one of these connector modules. So then it, it grabs all of the context dependencies, fields, image styles, languages, menu links, roles, taxonomy, etc., and exports those into a, yet another module. And that module it has the sole purpose in maintaining the state of configuration of the dependencies and bringing, when you install that module, it will bring yourself back into the state that the developer will put it into. So it's like, if you set the site title to be Rob's awesome website and then export a feature, anybody who installs that feature, if they install that feature, their site will be called Rob's awesome website. Basically, it's a way to transport configuration from one website to another. And it's a very good pattern inside of a lot of these distributions. It's actually fundamentally essential to building distributions. So you can export and import these things that Drupal does into a Drupal module, and it's a good pattern. And then you can put that module into your distribution. So that drush make file that I talked about at the beginning, the list of all the things, the pieces of software that you need to get from the internet to build a distribution, a lot of those things are these feature modules that you've exported that have a configuration to recreate a part of your website. But you can tell from the from the um, the title, the name of it, features, that the people who created it had uh, maybe a larger purpose for it. They actually thought that they would be able to build a repository of not configuration, but features, like an image gallery that works, or a forum that rocks, or a blog that has a good user interface. Things, trivial things, unimportant things like that, that actually craft a, a decent web experience. And um, it hasn't actually risen to that. It hasn't uh, risen to provide the apps concept where you download and install an app wherever you got it from, and it provides you an out-of-the-box experience that is exciting and full-fledged. Like, it, it never has you reached the end user of Drupal, these features. Features are almost exclusively used for configuration management. It's a good thing we're putting that into Drupal 8, the uh, configuration management. And the distributions, these features, they're used almost exclusively for organizing the building process of a distribution. I can't think of any example off the top of my head where somebody's built an image gallery feature and they distribute the feature. You can use that image gallery feature on anybody's website. You grab it, you get the dependencies, you install it, and boom, you've got the perfect image gallery you have. Does anybody know any features like that that actually get used like that? Features has a few limitations as a mechanism, and maybe that's part of why it hasn't lived up to the promise that it originally had, although it's a very useful thing. You know, half the room raised their hands, and the other half are probably in themers, so you don't use it anyway. Um, for example, you can't make the dependency chain features. You can't say, this feature actually depends on another feature, and have that work in an organized way, uh, with, you know, especially with the life cycle of a feature where you might have to update it and import it, change it, re-export it, maintain all those dependencies. As far as I know, you can't do several feature sets. That's a blank slide that represents a lost thought. <laughs> it was late. So when I was preparing this, I asked myself another interesting rhetorical question. I, I stumbled across a, a lonely, forlorn website that was actually mine. It was my group blog. And, and, and I, I was a little taken back, and I thought, how did it happen that a Drupal developer such as myself, somebody you know, neck deep in Drupal day in, day out, has stopped using his own website to communicate with the rest of the world? When did we stop writing our blogs on Drupal? How many of you maintain a Drupal blog now? Well, good on you, good on you. Why aren't the rest of us doing it, though? What do you use, Facebook, Tumblr, Google Plus? 
Your hermits do not communicate with us, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought about my own usage patterns over the years. And I thought, what's really important to me when I go to the internet? What drives the internet? Don't answer that question out loud. <laughs> what do people do on the internet when they go to a site like Reddit or Facebook or Google Plus? What makes those sites sticky? Images, videos, media, sharing rich communications, authoring things, quickly, fast, and easily sharing them with the widest audience. We used to call ourselves Drupal Community Plumbing, which has a strong implication that we facilitate communication and sharing and all of that. We moved a little bit away from that tagline, but I think that's still really close to our roots and where we want to be. So, I devised a little test. Compare, in the next series of very short videos, the image sharing experience between a few popular websites and a couple of Google websites. So, we'll start with Google Plus. So, yeah, grab some images. Can handle a lot all at once. Give it some title, you know. While you're doing that, the upload starts. We've got these nice little animated graphics when things pop in. And it's kind of an edited photo while the others are still uploading. Okay? Because, like, really snarky little comments that I love to make, so they're funny. And then you can really edit the crap out of these photos. You can do so many things right here in the browser. It's very nice. So I'll put a, a title and change the color as if you can see. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. And um, there's the image gallery then. It does facial, facial recognition and <laughs> I mean, it's fairly scary. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Google is um, analyzing every word that they say right now. I think this computer over here is streaming out to the internet. In fact. <laughs> and then you share it to like everybody on the internet. And all of a sudden, you know, 30, 50 people just got a, a notification that they're doing these pictures. And it's like great little animation. It's, it's cool. It's good. It's fun. You know, I like doing it. The internet can actually slower. I set it up with video editing. <laughs> So, next one. It's Google again, but also really important, the concept of a stream, how people interact with like, uh, the idea of content going through time, and how Facebook pioneered that. And it's so easy to upload an image onto a stream and just have it go out and, and, and be there and share it. These sites, Google didn't, Google didn't really even exist for practical purposes when Google was created. We've got a head start like you never believe. We've got 800,000 people worldwide working on this project. There aren't really a lot of excuses for why we can't build something like that. We can. We've got all the technology in the world to do it. They don't have a monopoly on any of that stuff. So here's Facebook. I mean, it's a similar story, right? I mean, it's going to take 45 seconds. We grab all your photos, you drag and drop them over. Uh, it starts all the processing in parallel. Uh, you can put all the metadata in while you're doing it. It looks up the people. Every field is in place editing, what the fields are exactly on the website where you're going to see them later, right? So you have a very one-to-one -one relationship about what you're doing and what the effect is going to be. You don't have to guess if I do this, it's going to, you know, if this butterfly flaps its wings in Madagascar, there's going to be a hurricane in California. It's not like that. It's like, oh, I'm editing the titles right there. And, you know, you've got your image gallery, share it out to a lot of people. Very nice. Compare that to uh, the second most popular, second and third most popular Drupal distribution out there. Okay, so already I have to enter an author, so I'm in a situation where I've got mobile and mobile. <laughs> so it's always fun. We do the parallel image upload, that's good, good for us. Um, this doesn't look quite as nice, but you know, maybe a little bit of theming would help. It's not exactly what you see, what you get editing, it's not in place editing. And it's this weird fact that there are about 30 extra fields, but I think that's just a bug. And you know, the, what you see is what you get, editors are very nice. This is, okay, it's, it's okay, right? I'm not here to say that we're hopelessly bad, but that's not Google's experience, that's Open Publish's experience. How many of you run your websites on Open Publish? Okay. How many of you have image gallery feature on your website that nice? As well publish. Nice, sir? Anybody? Yeah? 
This is a very smart guy over here. He's scary. <laughs> it's no surprise he's had a nice image gallery. We can't all have image galleries that nice. Not unless we collaborate, at least. So, there was that. Oh, there's actually even a distribution called OpenFolio, a Drupal distribution for creating image galleries. I'm going to test that too. So here's the experience that you grab one photo, upload it in a very standard, ugly Drupal form, and save, and there's another photo, and the extent of the image galleries, you can upload one photo at a time, and they're in categories, and they're in lists like this, with the nice, you know, the, the title of the photo in the, in the, in the bar across, you know, over there. That's the extent of the functionality of the distribution that's supposed to do photo galleries. And I'm not trying to criticize that person's work because I can tell you that took a whole lot of effort. It was not trivial. I mean, you know, that, was, that was somebody spending a lot of time uh, doing that. In fact, how much time would you spend making a photo gallery in Drupal if you had to start now? Uh, Alex, how much time was your nice photo gallery? Uh, a couple years. <laughs> so multiply that by two weeks. Like I said, he's a really smart guy. And that's how long it would take me. So in four years, I can have a nice Google image gallery. So this is how long. Step one. Step two, create a content type. This is one of the many, many, many tutorials for doing this. There's a previous actual session for host for this Google camp on creating image gallery. And I don't think you've got to accept it. Five, create the view. Because after all, there are like loads of video or tutorials on how to do it in Drupal, so obviously anybody could do it. It's trivial, really. I mean, it's, it's really not something you need to talk about at the camp anymore. There you go. Voila. It's easy. That's just one of seven right approaches. You have your choice. Follow the path. You can do it any way that you want in Drupal. There are probably a thousand ways to build an image gallery in Drupal. I'm not sure if any of the other ones can be done in less than nine steps, but maybe they can. So the concept, the, the theory, the hope, when people came up with the uh, concept of the feature server, was that you have Drupal 7 core, on top of that you build a distribution, and then you have this um, common enabling platform of features and C tools, a lot of which is actually going into Drupal 8, which is really good. Then you have an apps console. Okay? You'd be able to browse, see if you can visualize this type of experience. See if, I mean, this is a stretch. I know that for a lot of you, you're going to have to really go into the depths of your minds and stretch to see what I'm talking about. But imagine going to a place where you can see all of the available apps and you just choose them. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's there. It would be magic, right? It would be incredible. And that was actually the, the vision behind the features uh, module. Because there's a corollary module to that called the features server, where people were supposed to build a repository of full fledged end user facing features that did specific common tasks that may or may not be important, like image galleries, blogs, forums, the rock, etc. There aren't any of these feature servers on the wild that you can use, really. There are a couple of companies like uh, um, people who do open enterprise and phase two, they both from, and they have some total of five or six features, which are actually distributed with their distributions to begin with anyway, in those, and there's really not much of a point. Um, there's no public way to put your feature on them, so they're not growing these repositories. There's no commercial model behind them. <laughs> However, there's, there's a, bit of a, a bit of traction. It's not lost. It's not hopeless. There are some distributions that are using this apps features concept, and you can hook them up and, and, and actually download some code and do it. I mean, I did that last night. So I spun this site up. This is an open public site. I was using Campion because if you want to play install, it's really nice. This was actually fundamental to the creation of the company, this idea that you just do one click install a Drupal distribution and then look at apps and bring them in like that. They really believe in stuff. So I got the ideation, and you saw it, it downloaded it from a, a, a server, and there it is. Now I can submit an idea, and the feature 
of sucks, but I still got a feature. It was really great, okay? You know, I got code from some server, it installed it into my Drupal, and I was able to just use it just like that. So the problem is that there, there aren't many, there are like five features in that feature server. And there's no way that Christoph, who loves to build great features, could put one of his there. And there's no way that you, when you install your vanilla Drupal, can hook up your Drupal easily to query that feature server. And imagine the difference if there were 100 features or 1,000 features in there, and when you installed Drupal, it immediately went shopping. You know, I said, hey, congratulations. Welcome to Drupal. Welcome to the Drupal sphere. What would you like to install now? There's this ideation feature. Rob says it sucks, but maybe you like it. There's an image gallery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so, what's good about the app server? They're full of functioning features. Full by full, I mean there are five or six. Uh, you can download code from a central repository, and it's really a site, a point and click site building experience. If you could extend that to themes, then you'd really be enabling people to put together a, um, a Drupal behavior and a Drupal visual concept. Uh, without any programming experience whatsoever, and you wouldn't be sending them to do 10 step image gallery tutorials, uh, which is going to confuse most people. You know, when, when my goal is to have a grid of my images from my vacation, and I'm having to do use arguments and contexts and panels, that's really for a specialist type person. Okay, that's, that's not for the average Joe. What's bad about the app server? There's no public app server where people can put their apps. There's no commercial model behind it. There's nothing that you can buy there. There's no possible way that you can share any value back with the creator of those features. So, you know, free market, economics, who had eco-101, eco it's like there's no incentive, then people aren't going to do stuff for free for you in a lot of cases. So, there's an interesting difference. We're really good at, as a free open source community at building toolkits, entity API, search API, rules, views, C tools. These are toolkits. Why? Because we're building sites with a larger vision, a more important thing, a purpose, a, a use case for ourselves, and along the way, we need repeatable tool sets. So we share our tool sets, but we don't share the end results. Okay? Um, we, we create these sites that probably have great image galleries in some cases, but we stop short of actually sharing the image gallery. We only invest in the toolkit. So an app store or a feature server or whatever you want to call it would actually have a commercial model behind it to incentivize people to do that. Um, because the current incentive model stops one step short of having people share their end product with you or building their end product in a way that's actually suitable for you because it takes a lot of it takes a lot of hard work and really careful consideration to build a product that is generally useful, flexible enough for people's use cases, but yet specific enough to be useful right away. That's hard stuff. People in the community who are doing really hard thought about how to make this better. And one of them is Nedro Rogers. Nedro, glad you joined us out there in the east west coast of the USA. I hope you're online watching. Now, this rocks. He's been working on the concept of apps compatible, the set of guidelines and technical considerations that a distribution builder or a feature builder would want to follow if they want their app to be generally installable and maintainable across a lot of distributions. So this is where you break out of the entire website distribution model and you say, oh, my image gallery would work on open public, open publish, open atrium, commerce Kickstarter, and open folio or whatever. Okay, we're not there yet, but Nedjo is thinking about that. If you want to see his work, and you want to try the distribution called Open Outreach, and look through the entire suite of debut features that he has. Now, Nedjo's not a graphic designer. His font choices and color choices for the distribution are a little unfortunate, but just open up the CSS and change it quickly. Because <laughs> it's actually a lot more of a good than you would notice just by the first install. It's really good work, but it's only a, a two-person team out there. The company's name is Chocolate Lily, 
And they're really great stuff, but they're basically alone in this like two lonely salmon swimming up the river against the tide. It's, it's, it's a tragic story. But pay some attention to it and help out because it's it's actually a story that can end very well for Drupal. So let me bring this back to what I did when I did today, I guess. So commerce got us has a concept of our distribution, commerce kickstart, and a website that we maintain called Commerce Marketplace. And the interplay between those two places now, because there's a commercial agreement between every one of the um, offers that we have in our marketplace, it's growing somewhat slowly. We only have nine offers there now, I predict. By the time we get to Portland, we'll have maybe uh, 15 commercial offers, and we're going to add a bunch of free toolkit modules that are also useful. Um, because what we want to be able to do by the time we get to Portland is show you a Kickstarter where you connect Kickstarter to the marketplace the same way that you connect to Facebook or Twitter and let you know Facebook talk to Twitter or um, you know it's all off to really an all off to module that will give the marketplace um, a credential that you can share between Kickstarter and the marketplace and then you do things you can um, download the modules okay so you can get those 15 commercial modules and the 20 or 30 free toolkit modules that we're going to put up there. And you can also, and this is the point at which it differs from any model that's been there yet, you can enter commercial agreements with the partners that we put up there. And the uh, software will actually take you through that and help you set up your credentials, help you uh, set up an agreement with Giraffe or Yota or a payment gateway to start using their commercial service because in the world of e-commerce, you're not going to just make it on free tools ever. So you, you have to work with some commercial provider. You have to work with a payment gateway that's going to skim off your sales. And you're just OK with that, because it's the only way to do business online. So this is not a radical departure from what people do when they do e-commerce sites. We're just enabling it. And we have this concept of this interplay between the website and the central repository of cool things that you need that help you succeed. And we're getting really close to um, having that full story. Like, you should all come to Portland and see it when we launch it in May. Who's going to go? Portland? Good. We'll demonstrate it in Prague as well later in the year. Maybe we'll come back to London. John's going to London. Anyway, I'm really excited about that because it's a Drupal first. There's literally no marketplace that has commercial agreements for all the things on there that anybody can get onto. If they're commerce relevant, and you can get the software into somebody's website with the configuration, with the agreement to be in a commercial agreement, which means that we have incentive to keep making it better and better and better. Very excited about that. So, what are the good examples? Distributions. I mentioned open outreach. This is amazing. Those colors look exactly the same on that screen as they do mine. Those are the only colors I can make in presentation. Those are the real colors. <laughs> so, as I said, there's a list of available debut features that come with open outreach. Very, very, very solid basis to start with. Uh, for any site builder, this is a great starting point. This will accelerate your uh, customer site builds by a lot. I'm not certain of it. Another interesting one, Red Hand CRM. I mentioned it before by a company called ThinkShop. And here we see an interesting pattern that I just want to point out. Red Hand is not in itself a distribution, it's a module. But they also build a distribution around that module that configures it and really gets it to the point where you're ready to use it. And it's a little similar in a way to what we've done with Commerce and Commerce Kickstarter. So the Commerce platform and all of the surrounding modules that you need to make it work are their own thing. And then we have the distribution that puts it all together. So this is uh, an interesting pattern. Uh, Rooms, it's wild here, it's fine. Oh, there you are. So you can talk to uh, Ronald about this, but um, it's a hotel booking service. And it's uh, being done by the company Blue Spark. And it's really fascinating stuff. It's not everybody's use case if you want to do a hotel booking website, but if it is your use case, it's amazing. And again, it's a, a module, but there's a concept of a distribution that goes around it. 
Here's a good one. Okay. This is not a distribution, this is a module, simple news. I looked at the list of the most installed Drupal modules and scrolled down and 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 down until I came to the first good module that wasn't a toolkit. That it was actually a feature. Not in the Drupal features module sense, but it gave me functionality out of the box to solve one use case, one business problem. It wasn't used, it wasn't an exportable this, it wasn't an API that, it was a newsletter. Okay? This is the first one that I found that really cried out to me. This is a Drupal native end user feature that does what it says. Now, in the day when we had Drupal Camp, Antwerp, and Amsterdam, the, the cool thing back then was the image module. Guess what the image module did? Let you upload a whole bunch of images and have an image gallery and organize that image gallery. One module. You installed the module and you had your image upload and your image gallery all in one thing. Why did we move away from that? Well, because it didn't really interact with the rest of the system the way we wanted to. Oh, okay, well, an image should really be a field. You should be able to put a field on any content type. And then you should be able to make listings of those images, like everything that the module did already, right? You should be able to do that in a more abstract way. So we broke the thing down into its component bits. Same with the audio module. There was an audio module that would let you get, upload a whole bunch of MP3 files and have a player. That was back in 2005. Okay? Find me a module that makes it really easy to upload a whole bunch of MP3 files and have a player in Drupal. No, you're going to get sent off to a tutorial with nine steps that has views and C tools and contacts and whatever, which is fine. It's not a regression, but we have to bring it back home. We have to have that audio module that an end user could just install and have a playlist. We had it in 2005. We went away for, with a deep purpose in mind, but we need to bring it back home, and we need an incentive to do that. And Simple News was the first one that I found that did that, and it's very successful. It's got 56,000 uh, installs, which is quite a few, and it's got a whole world of modules around it, this list of related modules that enhance it in a specific way. It's a great example. Getting called the dead several times, every group operated at over the moment, so we do this. It's old stuff. But it satisfies one use case and it does it well enough for 56,000 websites. So, what else does the feature thing well, in my opinion? Well, I have to admit I'm a little scared of this type of stuff for the future of Google. And I have to admit that I think this is part of why WordPress has 17% of the internet and we only have two. It's because they have a very, very large commercial ecosystem about end user features that do things exactly what I'm talking about. They give you a image gallery or a slider or SEO or whatever. How many of you have ever paid money for a WordPress plugin? Go try it, it's fun, really. Try it, just buy one. <laughs> Go out and buy some $20. Get the taste of what that would be like. In, in, in your mouth, you know. <laughs> or your fingers, or in your eyes. However, you experience behind it will offer you support if you have a problem. They'll fix a bug if you find it. And they'll give you an upgrade when they make one. And they have an incentive to make one because guess what? From that slider, which is nothing more than a well themed view of images, they've made $160,000. This is one of a hundred competing products. There's a real market for this. That's money left on the table. I mean, let's not pretend. We're here because we're almost all in some way in business with Drupal. Why would we not do a business like that? Is that from WordPress.com? Is that the marketplace? Um, so, no, WordPress.com, I don't think they monetize their marketplace, and that means that they're third-party marketplaces. Um, I remember what this one was called. Theme Forest. What is it? Theme Forest. Theme Forest. Yeah. It looked pretty cool. I, 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 I wish that I could have installed some of those things on the Drupal. But a lot of them are just really nicely done things that you can actually do with Drupal fairly well, fairly easily. We're in a way better position to benefit from something like this than WordPress is. But we don't. We just don't. There's some blocking. <laughs> that stops us from ever doing anything like that. So how do we improve Drupal as a product? We've had Drupal distributions 
since the Drupal 4.6 era, and I first wrote about the potential of Drupal distributions in 2005. Drupal distributions have great potential. Turnkey solutions help us compete in new and different markets, something that could help Drupal become a significant player. The number of verticals is nearly unlimited, and the opportunities are numerous. Step four, distributions could help if we do them right. Does anybody know where that came from? Anybody look it up? Who remembers the small core debate? Wow. <laughs> so the small core debate came from a post called the Small Core Manifesto. I'm not trying to raise the small core debate again, but I'm really surprised that nobody's heard of it. Where the idea was that Drupal Core should be light, middle, small core and that we should be working on repositories of features and distributions that build the CMS functionality or the CRM functionality or the ERP functionality or the e-commerce functionality. And that any time you install Drupal, it should be able to morph into one of those things or many of those things based on what you decide to install into it. And that we have an operability plan that makes the CRM and the ERP and the e-commerce be able to work together the way that you would be able to install nearly unlimited software on a Debian installation through apt-get without running into significant con conflicts in the software because they have a very organized way of managing dependencies and upgrades, etc. And it's very well thought out and well documented and copyable in a lot of ways. <coughs> and in response, Dries wrote, in addition to what I just said, as a community, we have to take responsibility and make sure that distributions collaborate rather than compete. This was uh, 2009. Um, much like the way that we attempt to work together on modules. That starts by centralizing all the code on Drupal or, or by making Drupal core flexible enough, but also by encouraging shared design patterns and user experiences. With distributions, community responsibility and leadership becomes even more important. Building one product is hard, building a set of products in that way is even harder. My point, five years or five or so, between four, four and a half, five years went by, and we were saying exactly the same thing, and nothing changed. Um, that being said, when I realized that, that he even quoted himself when addressing a small core debate about whether or not we should like, scale back the CMS features approval and go with a small core or keep building up, which is actually the direction we ended up doing. Um, he quoted himself, and uh, the distributions, they're just not making it. They're 100% all the installs of Drupal, and uh, I mean, if you go and install a lot of them, I'm sorry, they don't have to pop. They give you crappy install experiences. It's hard to make a distribution of people. If you take the top five distributions after Commerce Take Start, four of them are two or three versions of Drupal Core behind, including a major security update. You can't use that. So, I don't think we're succeeding in that respect with Dries' vision, with my vision, uh, with the, uh, <laughs> the app-server vision of what it would be like to point and click the site together to have these common useful features that just work out of the box. Um, you know, there was a, who, re who remembers the App Store debate from, yeah? Like a lot of people got really upset when we started talking about that. And most everybody agreed that it was far too scary to do anything about. It's an opportunity to miss people. I really feel that way. I think we still have the opportunity, but we shouldn't leave it laying around anymore. We're going to do it for uh, the e-commerce world. You can watch us and see if it works. I hope it will work. And if it does work, then I hope other people will copy it and start to make their repositories of great things that people have done through Bull that are going to be reused that go beyond the toolkit that are actually <laughs> major features that enable people to have these WordPress-like experiences that are just great for the user in the end. So yeah, focus on the best of great stuff. You know, if you want to build something, if you want to make a model, go look at G+, go look at Facebook. They do things really, really well. Make a public apps repository. Let other people put stuff into it. Find a commercial model to put around it so that there is incentive to maintain the code that you're doing and solve common problems for the people who are using Drupal. And, you know, make sure that you've got a click to install and a click to update functionality so that the people who are not technical who want to build websites have a way to get the software that works, the software that they need, the software that they want, and reward you for having built it for them.
I think there's some good stuff in Drupal 8 that will help this, but honestly, it hasn't focused on this problem a lot. Probably the most useful thing here is that Drupal 8 takes the configuration management task that it features the module is supposed to be doing, and it internalizes it. It also makes you know, the whole experience is much nicer, and Drupal 8 is going to be great for us, and we've got uh, you know, more life in the Drupal project through it, and you know, I'm still very optimistic about Drupal, and I still love Drupal, and I can highly recommend this to come out and people have done great work, but it doesn't address anything that I talked about. <laughs> Not really. It doesn't, it doesn't really address the wide diversity of possible types of websites that you could point and click to build, that you can get from places <coughs> like WordPress that are available to Drupal. So that's my message. It's full of joy for not hurting and running. Hopefully I 